Good morning, church family and visitors. Raise your hand if some person in this church said, you have to come to church with me today. Thank you for being honest. There's one honest woman in this church. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation that somebody gave you to be here. Thank you for the invitation maybe that it was in your heart by God to say, um, you know, I need to be here today because Sam and I have something to tell you uh, that is hopefully as cool as that uh, little trick that uh, uh, Br Brother Hinkle just did. Was that not the most amazing? Um, when you are in the jam, who do you call? Jesus. Jesus. My cell phone fell down a drain last night in the parking lot. You know one of those water drains? Okay, finish, finish the sentence. Before you call... Okay, so there's at least one lady reading her Bible. Before you call, the Bible says, Jesus says, I will answer. He already had the crowbar in the back of my trunk. <laughs> and he's been sending me to the gym for a few months now so that, you know, uh, and I told my friend, uh, I need strength that is useful. Okay, uh, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that right? I mean, fire people have to be strong. Fire people have to be strong because they're useful. They, they're going to be toting those huge uh, coils of, 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 of hose pipe. Well, I had to use all of that last night just to crowbar that drain cover, which I was so glad actually did come up. Okay, and it, it probably was about two, maybe 300 pounds. I don't know. It was a good squat. But I pulled that thing up and then was able to put a rope around it and then pull it out of the way and then reach down and I couldn't find my phone. But then I remembered the TV show I'd seen where a ship had sunk and instead of going like this, it had gone like this. And so I reached further back in the pipe and there was my cell phone in the water. So then the next miracle happened. I took it apart, I dried it out. And it still worked. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I wanted to, wanted to get your attention with this story because I don't know where you've been this week, but I've had an interesting week. Okay? Did you see that young lady on the video? Okay, raise your hand if you know where Spain is. Okay, is it above or below France? Above. Raise your hand if you think it's above France. Raise your hand if you think it's below France. All right, you win. All right? Segunto is a school that the Seventh-day Adventist Church operates, and it gives us opportunity to send our kids to school in Spain. And did you notice what she did? She gave you a Spanish lesson this morning, you Mexicans. Did you hear that? The conquerors of Mexico said, th, th. Okay? If, yeah, if you're Spanish, you say th instead of sa, the Spain people. Yeah, see, th, th, th. See how those Mexicans speak about the Spanish? Those Spanish people, you know. So please understand, she is getting an education at one of our Adventist schools, and it is sponsored by this church who believes in Christian, I'm going to just say it, believes in Adventist Christian education. Okay, because there's a lot of Christian, there's a lot of Christian education out there, and I, I'm not dogging on anybody, but I'm just saying we have a huge system, and we support it. We support it not only with the little offering that you pick up here, but we also support every month the individuals that go to our schools, be they at Glendale. I noticed that uh, Brother Hinkle didn't say anything, but we know that our friend Jared, his brother, works there. Okay, and we're happy that we have at least two kids, Jared's kids, who go to that school. I uh, want you to know that I am very, very excited about our new principal at Glendale Academy. He is Nigerian. His name is Israel Olare, and he was here. 
And he brings a perspective to our education system that is very well worth being a part of. So I want you to know I am very supportive of what's happening at Glendale right now. I'm also very happy that she's at, at uh, Segunto. And I told Sam as we were coming up this morning, my brother went to the, the, uh, the school that we have in France. How many of you think being next to the Swiss border might be nice for a year? Hmm. Yes, well, uh, Collange sur Selève is a beautiful school that we have just inside France, right next to the Swiss border. And my brother and his now wife uh, spent a year there in school. And so he does. He, he helps with his IBM uh, assignment by speaking a little more French than the average American. So it's well worth the investment and the opportunity. Well, um, some of you know Jordan. Jordan, raise your hand. I know you love raising your hand in church. He doesn't. He's going to kill me later. Jordan and I are going to be up here next month, but this month I want to introduce to you my friend Sam Lewis. Sam Lewis uh, comes to us from Santa Clarita. Yes. Don't you love people from Santa Clarita? <laughs> I hope you do, because Sam has lived here a while, but he and his mom have been coming to church here uh, very consistently for a while. And um, uh, as I've gotten to know Sam, I, I know this. Sam reads his Bible. Sam reads the spirit of prophecy. And Sam reads a whole lot of other things too. Okay? Sam reads. And, and because he does, uh, I know that when he's in the audience, I better have my uh, stuff together. <laughs> because he's going to check up on me as he did the other week when he said, didn't you mean to say... And I said, yes, I did. Thank you. So, uh, not wanting to miss out on any of this wisdom, I said, Sam, what can we talk about together? Uh, and in fact, what can you talk about if I ask you some questions? And so I would like you to turn in your Bibles right now to Mark chapter 4, where we find a parable that is found actually in three of the four Gospels. So when, when that sort of thing happens, understand that it's probably one of the most important sayings that you are going to read in the Gospels if three out of the four actually report it. Now, there are some where it's four out of four, and those are the ones we also should take very special note of. But Sam, you told me why you think that it's important that we go with Mark instead of Matthew. Matthew would be my go-to right away, but he said, no, let's look at the Mark passage, and it's because of that one text that, that where, where, where uh, Jesus is actually talking to his disciples. And what does he say? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, And he said unto them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? And so, like, the reason I think that this text is probably, um, I guess, the quintessential text for this is that Mark seems to have taken note of the fact that Jesus is saying that if you can't understand this specific uh, parable, you can't understand any parable. So Mark is setting up a basis for understanding literally everything else that Jesus says from this point forward. Um, so that's, that's why I think that Mark is, is important. And if you study the actual parable, if you look at the parable, you'll find pretty much every aspect of the Christian life described in this one parable and in this one chapter. Those of you who are familiar, just let's quickly remind ourselves what, is, what does this parable say? We had it read to us this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, you have a sower. What is he doing? He's sowing seed. So that presupposes that what has happened in the field already? Come on, you farmers. The, far, the, the field has already been tilled. So if you want to get inside the head of Jesus right now, if you want to see the picture that he's seeing, you need to see a field that has already had the plow go through it. And that's going to be important with what we say. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was just saying that the, if we understand the actual description Christ gives, so he, he begins to give the description in verse 15. He talks about those who were sown along the path where the word is sown and they hear and Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. 
right? And in the various Gospels, we get different um, recollections of what Christ said, and they all kind of piece together. So we understand from Matthew that the soil is, is actually you. The seed is the word of God. The sower who sows it is the Father. So understanding that, and it, the word seed is, is important by itself, right? Yes, because it that's actually, um, if you trace the Gospel through the Bible, and you're tracing it all the way back to Genesis, you see the word seed all, all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. But then when you relate it back to... Let's make sure they remember. Where in chapter 1 of Genesis is he talking about? Because some of you have very blank looks on your face. <laughs> who is the seed that is talked about in... Because it's a who and it's a he. Who is the seed that is talked about in Genesis 1? Okay. And she will bear the seed. Okay? So, G yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying, um, Didn't want you to miss that. Yeah, and in Genesis chapter 1, we see it related to um, the creation and related to the story of, you know, for instance, God talks about making trees. Mm. And he says that he makes the trees with the seed in itself. Mm -hmm. And it, it's this whole description of a process of, uh, of course, the seed coming from the tree coming down and creating a new tree. And we, you know, that's generally understood. So the thing we're really getting at is, okay, why is Christ telling us, first off, we understand the seed is the word. Um, and why, why is Christ telling us that this is important for us to take note of? Hmm. And so I guess the first thing I would think of is if you, if you look in John chapter one, you'll find that John says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And okay. so when he's talking about the word, he's talking about himself being planted into the soil, not simply um, as some might think, you know, he's not talking about just reading the Bible or <laughs> anything like that. He's right. specifically referring to himself. Yes. And if the soil, on the other hand, is the individual, then the warnings that we're getting through this are warnings of simply it's God saying, I'm approaching you. Christ saying, I want to be with you and mm -hmm. be in you. Mm -hmm. And these are the ways in which that's prohibited or which you stop that. So looking at these, these three different types of soil that he talks about, the first one we read about is those sown uh, near the path. And he's explaining it here in verse 15. He says, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away this, the word that is sown in them. And in verse 16, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while, then when tribulation or persecution arises, uh, let's see, on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And so these, these first two he's describing, first off, he's describing, I think, <laughs> kind of ironically, your average church goer mm -hmm. to some extent. <laughs> Oops. Because, um, Sorry he's saying, if that's you. Okay. <laughs> because he's talking about the person who hears the word, they receive it, they get a blessing from it, but then it really takes no root in their life for the rest of the time. So it kind of, the devil just comes in and takes it out. It doesn't even really have an impact. It doesn't consume much You're of the mental time. You're talking about the one on the, on, on the pathway? Yeah. Okay. And so it doesn't really consume much of an individual's time. And I guess, that's, I guess that's really what he's driving at in all three of these examples is your exposure to him, your relationship with him, in the same way that a seed uh, creates a root system, and that root system has to have a relationship to the ground mm -hmm. and, and a relationship to nutrients. One, it doesn't even get a chance to put roots down. Right. There's, there's no chance because it's specifically, it's referring to, again, a person who they get the idea, but it, it's in one ear and out the other, essentially. Okay. You know, there's a, there's a blessing there, but the devil comes so quickly and takes it. Right. And a lot of times that comes as a result of, you know, virtually everything else being more important to us than what God has to say. Sure. Well, or, the, birds, yeah. the birds take it away uh, because it's, uh, it's exposed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not hidden. It's not down in the ground. It's... It's uh, easy, easy pickings, quite literally. Yeah. Okay. And then the second one. Uh, yeah. I'm. 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 Are you, are you catching the trend that he's talking about here? Yes. Okay. Surface, just below the surface, and then we're coming to the third or, or the second. The se second. Second. Go ahead. So the second ones are sown on rocky ground. Uh, the ones when they hear, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root in themselves, and they endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises, on behalf of the word, immediately they fall away. And so there's this, and I'm sorry, I'm reading from the, um, 
English Standard Version at the moment. But there's this concept that there are, so there are some who then take the word, and you might take it into the week. And I'm using a week as an example. Um, but you might take what you receive from God and then go on throughout your week. But the second something that's troubling happens or something mm-hmm. that's <laughs> problematic happens in your life, right. all of a sudden it's like, you know, pretty much a no-go. I don't, I don't want to abide by God's rules if they mean I have, I have to lose something. Yes. Or they mean that I have to sacrifice something. Do, th- do things from a different perspective. <clears throat> yeah, do things, but... Do things from the perspective of the seed growing in my life. Right. And, but what he's pointing out is not that they don't want to do the deed, but that they have a poor connection. Mm-hmm. So that the... Basically, their connection with God failed somewhere along the lines. They, they left that connection. They felt self-sufficient. It was weak. Yeah, exactly. Because okay. that's, that's what the rocks represent. You can't... It, things don't grow... Not a lot of soil between the rocks. Right, exactly. And, and roots don't, the root systems don't really do well. Picture that way. this too. In Palestine, one of the first things that you did when you cleared a field was to pick up the rocks and put them on the edge. So, uh, as something that I threw at Sam this week is that these soils that are being talked about right at the beginning are not in the middle of the field, the prepared field. These, these are on the peripheral. Okay? The edges, the rocks were not in the middle. They'd already been taken out and put on the edge. So these were the seeds that fell on the edges of the kingdom. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, sensing, I'm sensing that not only is God interested in sowing in good soil or taking care of good people, but he's interested in reaching out to those who are on the edges who may feel, I'm not in the center of this. I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just peripheral to the whole thing that's going on. But it, the parable is saying, beware, there's not a lot of good soil to grow your relationship with Christ if you're going to be on the edges. You're going to be in the rocks. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I agree. But I'm, And I'm also thinking like, Christ is, is specifically using this example. The, the reason, one of the other reasons I find this example to be very important is that um, you, you read later on that Christ never spoke outside of a parable to the multitudes. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there's a reason why he's using this, these kind of parables, this kind of phrasing. Yes. Right? And he talks about how people, they can hear, but they, they don't really understand, and they can see, but they don't really perceive. And you told us that you like Mark because here Jesus is recorded as no other place right. in saying if you don't get this one you probably won't get the rest either yeah exactly cuz every other every other parable there are other parables where he talks about seeds mm-hmm. you know we have the parable of the wheat and the tares mm-hmm. um where uh, a man plants a seed and uh, an enemy plants another seed mm-hmm. but th- like you were saying both seeds grow together until the harvest time right there's no um distinction between them god is god is building up both he is. He's allowing both to grow. Sends the sun on the righteous and the unrighteous at the same time. Right. So when his disciples ask him, shall we pull out the weeds? What does he say? He says, wait. He says, no. Because is it our job to do the harvest? No, it's not. It's not our job to separate, um, to separate the individuals. And, and again, often like, the same thing you also see later on in this chapter is the idea that you don't really, we don't really understand growth from the perspective that we should, Christian growth. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is he talks about how, he talks about, for instance, an ear of corn. Mm-hmm. It grows by the blade and then the ear and then the full corn in the ear. So it's, yes. a, it's a process that we have. Mm-hmm. And I think oftentimes we judge perfection by what we think of the exterior of someone's actions. So we, should be, we should be watching carefully that we don't judge maybe because we might misjudge. Right, because you don't know what stage of growth an individual is at. Hmm. It's, not because, it's not because the action itself may not be wrong, mm-hmm. right? Because you can be looking at someone and, um, and obviously, you know, someone steals or they cheat or they do these things. Yeah, these are wrong. These are evil in the sight of God. Mm-hmm. However, you don't know where they are in that process. If most people looked at David, when right. David had his great fall <laughs> that yes. I'm sure most of us know of, um, most of us would be looking pretty poorly at David. Mm-hmm. But the, to be honest, it was, it was part of his experience that he needed 
it was a necessary part of his experience because it was a lesson that he needed to learn through mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And so, again, judging by the outward appearance, you know, I, I once heard someone say, if outward appearances were equivalent to salvation, then the devil would have us all beat because he can be transformed into an angel of light. And so there is that whole aspect of Christ basically explaining that this work is first an internal work. It's going to change the inside of you before it changes the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, seed isn't visible in a single night. You don't go outside tomorrow and then all of a sudden something is just sprouted up. Right. Um, And then there's also like there's an instance where Christ walks through and he sees a fig tree that has leaves. That's right. And that you might perceive as a tree that's grown up, Mm -hmm. but it had no fruit. (laughs) Interesting. So there, there are different variants to what Christ is saying here. He's, he's using the, the physical world because that's what we seem to understand. Mm-hmm. We right? can relate to that. Exactly. Our nature is not spiritual. Mm-hmm. That is, that's not the nature that we are born with. We're not born with the nature that perceives the spiritual. And so Christ was illustrating the spiritual world through the physical world so that he could, he could get people to understand this relationship that he wants to have. Right. right? Like if he is the seed and we are the soil, these things don't separate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. these things have a there's a day-by-day tending you have to care for these things you have to um pay attention to them there, there's no like neglect if you neglect seed right if you just don't pay any attention to it well then it's going to die that's and that's just you know agriculture 101 anyone who knows anything about planting knows if you leave you know any sure. plant by itself it'll either it'll die or it. weeds will grow up Fertile. and kill it or that's right um but yeah so that's what i think christ is talking about here he's talking about in your life, pretty much, he, if this is the equivalent, he's saying in your life, what is your connection with me like on a daily? Mm-hmm. Not, and, and he uses seed again because that's something that it doesn't ever separate from the ground. It's not something that is, you know, sometimes it's in, sometimes it's out, if right. you know what I mean. Well, that's, uh, that's where I, the thought that's being cogitating right now in my head is, is the fact that in, uh, on the pathway, the seed doesn't get much into the soil. In fact, right. it doesn't at all. And so it's very vulnerable, and it, get, it can be just taken away. And so uh, then, then the rocks, you, you, you've got very little soil. And, and so, again, there's, there's an initial sprouting up, but there's no place for the roots to go because the rocks are already there, and it can't go through the rocks. It's got to go around the rocks. Um, so I, I get what you're saying. I, I get that, that this relational thing, and also the, what you're saying, the, the seed needs, needs the soil in order to do its thing right it, it, it naturally wants to to put down roots and to put up a shoot that mm-hmm. that's what a, what a seed does and so if it doesn't have the right environment if it's not fed is what you're saying mm-hmm. then then that thing that the seed is supposed to do that mission as it were that this that, that, that the seed and we could say that the seed is is God the seed is the seed is the gospel um, the seed is it it is on a mission, and if it doesn't find the right environment to be received, mm-hmm. it's not going to be able to achieve its mission. Right, and, and that's why I think it is the basis of all parables, because if you don't understand, first off, that God is the one planting the seed, he is approaching you, mm-hmm. that's the way that's going. It's not you approaching him. It's God is actually approaching you. He's drawing Correct. towards you, right. and if you don't first understand that and then understand that really you're only the only choices you have are how you respond to him, right? You came to church today. Would you consider that a response to God coming to you? You opened your Bible this week and you read your Bible. Would you consider that a response to God speaking to you? Okay. I don't know. That's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling that these things that we do are a response to the fact, don't we sing about this? He first loved us. That's a really cool thought. I, I really hope that we remember that today, that he does the first move. He makes the first move. He is the seed that comes, and he's hoping to find uh, growth. He's, ho- he's, he's hoping to, to have a relationship with us where he does his thing, which is to put down roots and to put up a shoot. Why? Why? Because then there's going to be fruit. There's going to be more seeds. That's the whole, that's the whole thing about not only the gospel, but also the plan of salvation. 
The plan of salvation involving you and me is that having taken root in our life, that we would send up a shoot and then, I mean, I'm kind of skipping to the end, but we're going to come back to the other soils in a moment, that we would send up a shoot that would then be reproductive, that, that then would have other seeds on the top of it. But here's, here's the piece, and I, I mentioned this to you this week. What happens to the seed? The one that goes into the ground. I'm going to say it dies, but then I'm going to use maybe a better word that we might have a little better time relating to. It transforms. Yes. How many of you have ever had to throw out a rotten, well, what you thought was a rotten potato? Now, first of all, it was very stinky. Second of all, it had eyes. We call them eyes. But those were roots coming out of the potato. It was doing its thing, right? It was doing its thing. It was putting out roots, and it, it, it would ultimately have put up a shoot, and if it had been in that garden, you would have piled up the dirt like you're supposed to with potatoes, and out would have come the shoot, and then you would have known that down below it was growing other potatoes, because that's what potatoes do. So the seed dies, it transforms in order for others to come to faith. Jesus said when he left this earth in response to the question, is now the time that you are going to make Israel great? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Jesus responded, you know what? That's my father's business. Then he put a period after that, a full stop after that, and he moves on and he says, but you will be my witnesses. If you've ever taken time to think about what that means, this is your parable right here, right now. And the realization that his entrance into your life is going to be transformative that he will transform you, that you will no longer fit in many respects with the, 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 the essence of the world and what it thinks is growth and or success. You will no longer fit with that. Those ideas are now going to die or be transformed so that there can be more individuals in the harvest. In Sabbath school, in adult Sabbath school, we reminded ourselves again this morning there are only two kinds of people. One is selfish and one is unselfish. The sower came to show us the unselfish life. Let that one sink into you because, my friends, if you think about it, that's where everything starts. And if you're interested in being part of the unselfish life, being part of the kingdom of God, where there will be a harvest one day, because he promises that his word will not go out and not come back to him fulfilled, there will be a harvest one day, and that harvest can and, I pray, should be part of your experience. Because you have allowed the, the word of God the, to come into your, into your life to transform the way that you do life now. And that you're not saying, oh, shucks, man, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't wear this and I can't... You're saying, because I am now a new creature in Christ, I have the privilege of being part of this transformative system that Jesus brought into the world. And, well, you're making a point here um, as well that uh, another reason why I think Christ used nat the nature and he used birth and he used things of that, of that kind to describe his kingdom is because one of the rules in the natural world is whatever, whatever comes from you has your nature, mm. right? So in other words, if you plant an apple tree, it's going to grow apples mm. and those seeds will also grow apples and yes. so on and so forth. Yes. And the same with a human. And, and it, 
<clears throat> it comes to more detail with a human because when you have a child, that child reflects your image yes. to a large extent. Um, and also they reflect your, your habits. They reflect your, in, in many ways, genetically, they get traits from you. Mm -hmm. They might walk like you or talk like you and various other things. <clears throat> but Christ is using this example as well because you really only have the choice of soil. Once the seed is there, mm -hmm. you are whatever was planted. It's hmm. just a matter of, of allowing that to grow yes. into what it needs to be. You know, I was, I was telling you the other day that I think one of the biggest problems that we experience in the Christian life is not fighting. It's not about fighting the temptations and the sins and those things. It's about not fighting God who's trying to do the work in our hearts. How many of you, how many of you get what he just said? Because I, I didn't. So could you say that again? Yeah. <clears throat> This, 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 is, this is wisdom here, so please understand this. Go ahead. I'm basically saying that, to try to articulate it differently, it is us that are, that's fighting God. God is trying to save us, right? When a sin or a temptation comes, we, are, we have a pull from God to go the other way, mm -hmm. and you have to fight that pull. It's not, it's not a matter of us fighting um, against a temptation. And that's where we fail because we think for a second, oh, you know, let me get up and let me be the sower. But, you know, a rose cannot sow itself. It doesn't make sense, right? A rose can't, <clears throat> cannot so plow I'm, if, ground. If I'm, and, if I'm fighting a temptation, I'm actually thinking that I'm God. Right. And, and that's, that's where the, the major thing is. It's... It, <clears throat> the devil loves for you to think on your, to think that you can think on your own. The whole thing with Eve in the Garden of Eden was, this is logic, this is rationality, this is where you are. This is, you know, and, and what that is, is, and I was talking to you about this as well, what that is is really just a form of atheism, right? Because it means you don't trust the divine to be able to do what the divine says it can do. You don't believe in divinity. You don't believe that, that there is something supernatural. And I, I always say this about Christians, and that is, if there is no super, supernatural interaction in your life, why are you a Christian? What, what's the point? What, are we, you know... I warned you. I warned <laughs> you that, that there would be a lot of stuff. I'm hoping you're catching this. Because what he just said would make a lot of us church people, what he told me this week, honest atheists. Or maybe we should be honest atheists. Did you catch what he just said? That we're fighting God... If we think that we need to overcome temptation, we need to, and that we're not allowing God to be God, we're thinking that we need to do it. And yeah, and this principle goes all the way back to, and unfortunately goes all the way back to Lucifer in heaven, right? He thought he could do a better job than God was. He was effectively he effectively didn't believe that God was who he said he was, which is all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing. And so, because if, if all those things are true, right, if God knows everything, he has all power, and there's really not much you have to concern yourself with. If you really believe that, there, there aren't really many things. And that's why Christ, you know, some people might consider some of his statements extreme where he says, you know, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, yes. and they don't toil, and they don't spin. They don't go through any uh, effort. They just, it just happens. Mm -hmm. And the same thing you see, I think, in verse, I want to say verse, let's see. Go on. Yeah, when you, when, you start getting to, when you start getting to the end, when you get to like verse 26, in, in verse, actually verse 27, he says, he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The farmer does. The, the farmer does, but the, he, the he doesn't know doesn't, how. The farmer doesn't know how. Right, and right, so that's, that's right. the idea is that when, when this Christian life grows, right, when the, the outgrowth happens, when you see the fruit, it's God who's done all of that. You don't really even know how it's happened. No. And, and I've met many Christians who've had that experience where they have a lot of, uh, they had a lot of issues when they first came into the Christian life, but mm -hmm. now those, those issues just disappeared. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a matter of them putting forth the effort or trying to change themselves as much as it was a matter of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why Christ often, almost always in the Bible, refers to it as either a marriage or a father and child relationship. Mm -hmm. Because there's this, there's this union, there's this, um, there's this thing that you understand about that. Like, for instance, you wouldn't expect a husband and wife to not talk to each other for a full week. That's just not something you would expect. It happens, but it's not right. But, it's, but my, point is it's a, my point is, if it is, then the relationship is struggling, right? Yeah, the relationship, 
Amen. The relationship would be struggling if that happened. Right. Okay, so if it, if it is, you would if it is, you would have problems. But we don't see that with God. So we can go two, three, four weeks without talking to God, and the relationship has no problems in our mind. And that's why I think often God describes himself, he personifies himself, because he wants us to think of him as a person in some sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to talk to you. I want to be with you every day. I want to spend that time with you. Yes. And more than that, it's for your benefit, because you need to spend this time with me in order for you to grow, in order for you to become what you need to be. Son of righteousness. Right. And so that, that's, that's what this whole parable is about. The next type of soil is the soil that falls among thorny ground where the thorns grow up and choke it. Mm -hmm. And all that really means is that's essentially the same thing as saying everything has become more important than I have. So in relationship terms, that's what you would say, right? You know, someone, they go to work, they stay at work all night, they come home, and obviously the wife just believes that the husband loves her, right? Mm -hmm. No. She's like, you know, why do you spend so much time at work? Do you not care to spend any time with me? There are these questions that happen because everything takes up more time than God does. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I'm saying. He's using these naturalistic terms to actually open our eyes, in a sense, to the spiritual world. Because our, according to Christ, you know, our father is not of the same source. When he talked to the Jews, you know, a lot of times we like to pass it off on the Jewish nation and say he was saying, you know, you're, you are of your father, the devil. Mm -hmm. No, he's saying that of... All, all descendants of Adam. Correct. Everyone who has submitted themselves <laughs> to the devil by means of just genetics. So he's saying to us, but he's offering us something besides that. And, that, and that's what I was talking to you about, that mm -hmm. God does not come at us to try to destroy us, even though the devil likes to end it right there, right? God says, you're bad. And so the devil likes to stop the sentence right there. Mm -hmm. But really, the sentence ends with, here's help. Right? Here's, here's your message. How many of you want out. to say amen to that today? Sentence doesn't end with you're bad. Here's help. Here's help. Um, one wow. of the most common, wow. I guess, instances of that is, is the Laodicean message, right? Okay. Uh, the message in Revelation where God says that his church is poor, miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. Mm -hmm. And you stop there. And it's like, well, no, if you, if you stop there, you miss the whole point of, of him saying that. Mm -hmm. See, God is approaching essentially a delusional people who think that they're rich and mm -hmm. he's telling them, I have riches, and I'm willing to give them to you. Yes. Here's a new coat. Here's a new, here are, here's eye salve. Here's gold. Yes. And he's, so he's offering us wealth, and we're turning the other way to that because mm -hmm. we think we have everything already. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of what this same message is. It's, it's a message of dependence. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and it's a message of complete dependence because the seed, the seed and the soil literally do nothing by themselves. So... Every, every type of apple tree, if you go to an apple orchard, that apple orchard existing is entirely dependent upon the owners. Mm -hmm. If the owners stop doing anything, right. then it goes, it goes out of existence. We've all seen orchards like that. Right, and that's, that's kind of the, I guess, the crux of the initial deception that the devil has put on everyone, which is that anything can exist without God, which is a problem. You, nothing can exist without God. God created everything. Mm -hmm. And so when we sin, you know, Christ, taught, Christ says, those that, lo that hate me love death. Mm -hmm. And you, it seems like, okay, what does he mean by that? But when Makes you sit sense. back and think about it, if God is life That's right. and you hate God, you love death. That's right. Whether you realize the full end of that or not, that's, this is the direction you're going. And this is what God wants to do in you is that he wants to get that entire nature, that entire mode of thinking about him and about his word mm -hmm. out of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And he, this is why I think, this is why, one of the reasons why God sent Christ as a person. Because it's, it's something you can relate to, something that's tangible, something you can speak to. Mm -hmm. And he wants you to know that that's, that's who he is. But on the other hand, when Christ leaves and he sends his Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. who's to be his representative, we don't treat him the same way. We don't no. treat him like he's ever, ever there. But that was what Christ gave him there to be. He came, he gave another comforter. That's what John calls him. So Jesus was the first comforter. Right. And he says, I'm going to bring you another comforter. And that, that word in and of itself has a whole nother depth of meaning than most people realize because we don't actually have an English equivalent to that no. word. Paraclete. And that, that word, um, paraclete, would be a, a wealthy person who would stand on your behalf in court because he cared about you as a friend. And their reputation would go on the line for you. So if you had committed a crime, they were essentially saying, I'm a character witness, 
and my character, I'm putting it on the line for my friend. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these different things. That it means so many different things. Christ is saying, this is your close friend. I can't be here with all of you at once. Mm -hmm. But he comes and leaves another one who can, another comforter who can come and be with us. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the, the crux of the entire gospel. And the crux of this story is that God wants us to be in a, in a consistent relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean, see, a lot of times we think we're failing because of something we're not doing, mm -hmm. which right. is a problem. It's often because of something we are doing, which is we, we push aside the voice of the spirit. Right. Spirit says, take five minutes to talk to me. Spirit says, you know, read a scripture. Or the spirit says, pray, just pray you know? And, mm -hmm. and so we get these, these different impressions from the spirit and we push it aside. And what we're doing is we're saying, I don't want you here. Mm -hmm. So we know we read of grieving the Holy Spirit or, or the unpardonable sin and everyone gets afraid, but they don't realize it's like if you tell someone not to come over enough, you tell someone not to come to your house enough times and they really care about you, then you're getting that, you are grieving them. Grieve mm -hmm. is a love word. I heard, as I heard a minister once say, he said, grieved is a loved word. It mean, you can't grieve someone who does not care. Right. And so, sure. and so this, is what, this is what we're getting at is that Christ, again, and, and you could expound this particular parable virtually in every single way in the gospel correct because it spreads through everything mm -hmm. but he's trying to get people to initially understand all the rest of the things christ says how are you going to receive them are, is your heart going to be open are you going to hear it at church and then is the devil going to come and steal it out of your heart mm -hmm. you know are you going to um are you going to hear it at church and then all of a sudden you don't have time for it because you need to go to work because money is more important. Or self-dependence. Or self-dependence. Yes. And, that, and that's actually, to be honest, self-dependence might be a more scary one because in that sense, it's like you're trying to fight the devil yourself, but <laughs> if you're not doing that on God's terms, then you're shadow boxing. You're, you're fighting nothing but yourself, mm -hmm. right? Because in, in some sense, you know, God is the only one. First of all, God is the only one who can fight the enemy. Correct. If you understand, like, this is not, we, we look at, sometimes I think we look at the devil as being a lot dumber than he actually is. And what I mean by that is, this, this being chose one thing out of anything in the universe he could choose to test God on. Right. He tested the one thing that would force God to become a man. And that was, he said, you are not love. You are not who you say you are. In order to prove that, God couldn't just poof. You know, if he had said, you're not the creator, God could have made a planet. Right. If he had said, you know, you're not all powerful, he could have just wiped them out of existence. But he said, you're not love. And you can't prove love with power. No. So God had to do what he did. And he, he forced him into this position where he had to come and show us that that's exactly who he was. Wow. wow. And so I think that in these stories, what we're really getting at is God always, he wants us to call him father. He refers to, he refers to himself in that figure. Mm -hmm. And remember, Christ always said that the works that I do, I'm not doing. It's the father who's doing them. Mm -hmm. And so we get kind of to a point where we realize that it is God in all three persons attempting to speak to us, attempting to grab our attention, attempting yes. to, like you like to say, reformat us. Mm -hmm. You know, our original nature was sinless. Mm -hmm. Now our, na our nature now is sinful, mm -hmm. and all he's trying to do is get us back in operating order. Mm -hmm. You know, Agreed. get us back into the position where we need to be. Agreed. But the problem is, we are we get into a position where again the devil tempts us with the same thing he knew worked on him, which is maybe you're a little bit wiser than God. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe this money is made is going to make you happy. This is going to make you happy. Maybe spending time you having control over your own life is going to make you happy. That's right. And so. In essence, what he does is he tries to scare us away from the word. He says, there are too many rules and regulations in the Bible. There are too many things that you have to follow. Look at this, look at this. Look at all the things you have to give up. Mm -hmm. But see, th those things are all sin, which means those things are all the absence of life. Mm -hmm. So you're really giving up Part nothing. Of a different system. You're giving up nothing. You're really not giving up anything. It's like if you walked up to someone on the street who was panhandling mm -hmm. and they were poor mm -hmm. and you said... You know, I walked up to them, I said, here's my suit, mm -hmm. and here's a million dollars. I wish I had a million dollars to give. Mm -hmm. But if I said that, you, your, your response, the person's response on the street wouldn't be, or it shouldn't be if they're rational, <laughs> that, you know, I don't, I don't want that. I don't need that. Look, I'm fine. Like, are you trying to insult me with that? But that's our response. 
Because God is coming to us every day saying, okay, look, that thing that you think you want, it's, that's going to destroy you. Let me help you. Let me give you something better. Mm -hmm. Let me fix this problem in your life. And instead, what happens is the devil then comes in and says, you have to fix that problem yourself. And therefore, it's a burden. It's a weight. And now, all of a sudden, God's commands all become weighted down. When in reality, all he's trying to do is say, look, I'm only pointing this problem out to you because I want you to realize that you cannot do it. My yoke is easy. My right. burden is light. And then that's what I was saying to you as well, that God presents the impossible to us on purpose. So we look at the Bible and we see all these almost like completely impossible commands to follow. He does that on purpose because if he doesn't do that, then it wouldn't take we, divinity to fix it. We wouldn't need him. So you wouldn't know it was God who was doing the work. Correct. But the fact that it does take that means that if we're honest, if we really do believe in God, then he'll do the work and he'll fix it. And that's why I say that there are so many, I think, dishonest atheists in the church, because we don't see, we don't see a manifestation of power. And the reason we don't see that is because people don't believe God can do it. It's not because God can't do it. It's not because he's unwilling to do it. And so that, that leaves only one, only one more option, and that is... You know, people think what the atheist thinks, which is the atheist thinks, well, my reason and my logic are supreme. My own thought process is supreme, and therefore, that's, that's the rule I'm going to follow. Mm, mm, mm. And, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Christ was trying to change that nature, because our, our entire way of looking at things is counterintuitive to the way God looks at things. It's entirely counterintuitive. You look at Moses or Joseph. You look at Moses being in the wilderness for 40 years as a shepherd, and you think to yourself, this is success in the eyes of God. Right. You look at Christ on the cross, this is success in the eyes of God. You know, <laughs> or you look at like Isaiah and the prophets and all the, the incredible, uh, horrific things that they went through. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, like, this is success in the eyes of God. But it's like, the, but the world will tell you, on the other hand, that all of these men were essentially failures. Mm -hmm. They would have told you that at the time. That's right. But the problem is the word is still alive. So it was success, even though we never counted it that way. You know, even though looking at, looking at these scenarios, looking at these men, we may not have counted their lives as success. God knew exactly what he was doing the entire time. So when you get to the end of the parable, you find out that there was success. And the right. success was that there were more people, there were more seeds on the top of the corn. Right. And that that is truly the end result, which we could say is John 3.16. Right. That he's loved the whole world, he's sown his love into the whole world, and that his wish, his deepest desire, is that the whole world would embrace him, take him in, become part of his kingdom. Right, and that, that's why he can be so simple when he spoke, mm -hmm. right? He didn't have to have a, a complicated, you know, paragraph-long explanation of his gospel. Mm -hmm. When he was talking to, he was talking to some Greeks who came to the temple, mm -hmm. and this was the only conversation he was going to ever be able to have with them because, first off, they were only there for the Passover, right. which was that weekend, and also that happened to be the week he was going to be crucified. Yes. So he only had one shot one thing to say to them, and all he said was, if a grain of wheat doesn't fall on the ground and die, it will be alone. But if it does fall on the ground and die, it will bring forth fruit. That's all he said to them. Hmm. It was a very simple couple of verses. You can read it. And yet they understood exactly what he was saying. Because what he was saying was he was talking about a transformation of nature, and that's yes. what God is getting at. Did I not warn you? I think there'll be plenty to talk about over lunch. Um, Samuel, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are blessed by God. I don't know. What I take away from this what I'm going to invite you to do as a response to this today is to pray a prayer with me, and it goes something like this. This week, God, this week, if you can't pray for a week, 
maybe you should just say today. Today, I want to stop fighting against you. And I want to let you into my life to change me the way that you need me to be. That's going to be my prayer. Anyone want to join me? Amen.